Hello, everyone. I'm Frederick. Uh, I work at Red Hat, um, which was, if you haven't heard previously, or recently acquired by um, Red Hat. Um, no, Chorus was acquired by Red Hat. Um, yeah. So um, today I want to talk about auto-scaling uh, your workload on, on Kubernetes with um, the metrics from Prometheus. Um, but what, what, what do I want you to walk out uh, of this room with in terms of information? So I want, to, want everyone to understand what is the officially recommended way to auto-scale workloads on Kubernetes. Um, I want to walk you through the history um, of this stack and this architecture and how it has evolved over time to understand um, why, why we are where we are. Um, and then I want to give everyone a future outlook of uh, where um, I know things are going uh, and some predictions of where I think some things will go. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about auto-scaling. And uh, first, I want to make sure that we all understand um, the terminology uh, and have a common understanding of what we speak of when we say auto-scaling. So on a very abstract sense, um, we want to be able to cover demand of our user-facing applications, or maybe not user-facing, really anything that what our customer is, whether that's actually an end user or um, some developer within our infrastructure, it doesn't really matter. We want to be able to cover our demand um, based on um, our metrics. And in order to be able to do that, we obviously need to collect those metrics. Um, but really fundamentally why we, why we do all of this is in order to cover our uh, service level objectives. So things like uh, latency of our APIs or um, the time within uh, we, which we want to guarantee our, to our users that we work off items in a work queue, for example. Um, whether these are actually good, um, good examples depends on your um, individual problem, but that's uh, generally what an SLO looks like um, of your service le level agreement. Um, and more often than not, we can't actually directly say that we want to auto-scale directly on our objective, um, but we use something called a service level indicator, which, um, as, the, as the name says, indicates that it influences our objective. Uh, so an example of that could be in order to process um, some request within um, five minutes or something, um, our queue length needs to be um, worked off um, rapidly. So we want to make sure that our queue length is below 50 or something like that. That's, again, whether that actually makes sense in your case, you need to evaluate that. But you know your applications best. So you, just like with all other monitoring, need to figure out what are the requirements of your users, and you need to set, um, set those and collect those metrics in order to be able to know if you're performing the way that you're promising to perform. Otherwise, none of this really works, and that's why we want to do auto-scaling. So in terms of auto-scaling, there are two types of auto-scaling, and um, I will mostly be uh, focusing on the first one, uh, but I will still be explaining um, the differences. So, um, there's horizontal auto-scaling, and more specifically in Kubernetes, we call this the horizontal pod auto-scaler, auto um, often abbreviated as the HPA. And what this means is, in order to cover our demand, we increase the number of replicas of our application. Um, and I think this one is particularly important because um, although there is also vertical pod auto-scaling, um, or just in, in general, vertical auto-scaling, meaning we don't increase the replicas of our application, but we increase the individual size of our replicas. Um, so while vertical pod auto-scaling is, some, is uh, very important as well, um, it becomes impractical to scale beyond a certain, certain size, because um, even though we have really giant servers out there with two terabytes of RAM and gigantic amounts of uh, CPU, even those hit some physical limit at some point and become impractical um, to scale out. So uh, what we often focus on is horizontally scaling, because 
within uh, cloud infrastructure on, with our cloud providers, it, we can basically treat it as endless resources, um, unless we're maybe a Google who um, scales in data centers, not in uh, instances. Um, but um, even, that, even on that kind of level, we, we, could, do, we could apply the same principles. And uh, just to cover, cover this, uh, again, we, the, the, our demand, the um, necessary amount here is calculated in terms of Kubernetes, the resource requests and limits. Um, so now that we've covered um, autoscaling in a, on an abstract sense, let's look at how this was historically done uh, on Kubernetes. And depending on the Kubernetes version that you are running, you may already be using this stack. Um, and as you can tell by my language, uh, there is something new coming up or already there. Um, so historically, um, autoscaling was heavily based around a component called Heapster in Kubernetes. And Heapster is a monitoring system that collects metrics from your infrastructure, mostly from a component in your Kubernetes cluster called C Advisor, uh, which, sits, which is actually compiled into uh, the kubelet in Kubernetes. And uh, through that, it gathers inf infrastructure metrics about your containers, things like CPU, memory usage. Um, and there's also some possibilities to do custom metrics uh, collection. And th then when Heapster goes around and collects all of these metrics, it then writes it into some sync, so into some other time series database. And uh, when we wanted to consume this um, in terms of horizontally scaling, what we did is we created a horizontal pod autoscaler ob object. And um, how this object works is that we have a reference to the particular resource that we want to scale. So the, in this particular example, we have a deployment. But this could just as well be a stateful set, or really anything in Kubernetes that um, has replicas in it. Um, and it, actually, this is generic in terms of Kubernetes, because anything that is scalable, and we'll go into that a bit more in detail later, um, can be used here. Uh, yeah. And then the next fields, uh, I think, are obvious. So we always want to make sure that at least five replicas are available of this. And uh, just in order to not explode the resources uh, that this needs, um, we can also specify a maximum replicas. Um, and Within this design, there was only the possibility to do um, autoscaling based on CPU usage, and more specifically, percentage. So uh, the resource request, uh, in terms of, of CPU that we give it, if it has 70% in this case, um, or more, then we start spinning up more um, pods of this um, deployment. Now, uh, this is. This was really cool. We got this in Kubernetes 1.2, um, and we could autoscale. And in theory, um, all problems out there can be converted to a CPU-bound problem. Now, um, you probably already understand uh, some of the problems with this, which is, it's, while it's theoretically possible, it's not very practical to do this based on uh, CPU usage. We um, may very well have something that is uh, much more efficient when it's uh, memory bound, um, or really it's very hard to boil down our SLOs to something like CPU percentage. Um, some organizations may be able to do this, and it's great for those organizations, but it's very hard to get to that point to be able to do that. And over time, as um, we developed uh, Heapster, um, so Heapster only started with a few um, data, data syncs. So um, we were super excited when all these vendors came in and said, yeah, we want to do auto-scaling uh, and monitoring with Kubernetes as well. And we said, yeah, all these vendors are behind this, what we want to do. Uh, this is really cool. And as it ha happens so often in um, open source projects, and this is perfectly normal, um, is that not everybody maintains the code uh, that they contribute. And um, I think this was less a problem of the community rather than us, the developers um, of Heapster, who made uh, the architecture this way. Um, and so over time, uh, this created a lot of problems. It caused outages in uh, Kubernetes clusters. Monitoring is basically the most important component of your um, 
of your infrastructure, so it needs to be extremely stable. Google actually has, um, I don't know if they still do, but I know uh, that they at least used to, uh, they have, in terms of priority, they have something like medium, high, and monitoring. So monitoring is the most important uh, schedule, scheduling uh, priority. Um, there are other organizations doing this. Um, and so uh, we want to we make sure that whatever we provide is super robust. Um, and what's also, what also was strange um, was, because, was that because of how Heapster works, that it, it collects, it must collect the um, metrics and write it into some time series database. The big, um, the big monitoring system that is super popular within Kubernetes, which is Prometheus, fundamentally cannot work with this. Um, and then heaps are also uh, exposed metrics in Prometheus format, but we can't use Prometheus, so this was confusing uh, to all of us. Uh, so we, we decided about a year and a half ago uh, that this pipeline needed a redesign. Um, and we wanted to solve all of these problems uh, that we had previously um, created ourselves with Heapster so that we um, can go forward and uh, just be productive, do auto-scaling and stable monitoring. So one of those things uh, that we wanted to achieve here is not be bound uh, to only be able to scale um, based on CPU. We want to be able to auto-scale on arbitrary metrics. And what we came up with are, were the resource and custom metrics APIs within Kubernetes. And um, this, these were specified about a year and a half ago and uh, are actually available in all Kubernetes clusters starting Kubernetes 1.8. So most likely, uh, all of your clusters already support these. So what's important to understand about these APIs, and uh, we made this very, um, very much a goal of these APIs, is that um, they're just a specification of APIs. So the individual imp implementations are up to the vendor to do. So we don't have this model again where there's one repository where everybody uh, puts their integrations, and we again get unstable end-to-end uh, -end tests in Kubernetes, and in general, it slows down the entire Kubernetes um, development. Uh, instead, these vendors or the community around these vendors um, or other uh, open source projects need to write these, maintain these, and um, maybe hand off ownership. Um, so this is, it's more explicit than whenever when anyone, excuse me, um, creates one of these um, adapters that they're responsible. Um, so that was important for us. And something uh, that's important to understand when using these, uh, these APIs only return a single value, so the most recent value of that metric that you're requesting. So the resource metrics API is actually uh, very well defined about the metrics that it does expose. So these are uh, something that we sometimes also refer to as the core metrics. So things that every workload in your Kubernetes cluster has. So CPU, memory, file system, those kinds of metrics. And while today uh, this only includes CPU and memory, we do want to extend these. Um, but this is what we have today and what is stable today to be used. And um, there is a canonical implementation for this because the resource metrics API is actually important for a Kubernetes cluster to run um, by itself. So if you do things like kubectl top um, or you want to auto scale based on CPU or metric, uh, on, on memory, um, then you can do this consistently in every Kubernetes cluster. And you don't need a monitoring uh, vendor to do this. And um, before uh, we actually implemented this, we did the calculations and said, OK, Kubernetes guarantees a scalability of 5,000 nodes with an average of 30 pods per node. And if we have about 10 metrics for each of those pods, then we end up with, and, and divide that by the uh, collection interval, which is every 60 seconds, the metric server would go and uh, scrape all of this information from the nodes. Um, then we end up with uh, 25,000 metrics ingested per second, which keeping this in memory is a very, very low uh, amount of metrics. And um, yeah, so we went ahead and implemented this, and it performs really well. Uh, and 
This is now the default um, implementation of the resource metrics API. In theory, these vendors could still go ahead and implement these, uh, this API, but important is that when uh, you go on any Kubernetes cluster, we can be sure that everything works because this is the default thing that is deployed. For example, um, GKE deploys this, uh, Minikube deploys this, and pretty much all of the other um, vendors of uh, managed Kubernetes clusters do this. And of course, also uh, most of the installation uh, tools do this. If they don't, shoot them a pull request uh, because this is actually a requirement of every Kubernetes cluster. And then the custom metrics API was actually the thing that we really wanted out of this pipeline. We, um, the semantics is the, are the same as with the uh, resource metrics API, which is uh, you get the latest sample of that time series that you're requesting. Um, but because this is custom, by definition, we don't have any defined metrics for this. Um, and because it's very specific to how you produce your metrics, there cannot be a default implementation for this. So there must be an implement implementation by your uh, vendor for your um, monitoring system. And with the custom metrics API, each of your metrics actually must be related somehow uh, to a Kubernetes object, and we'll see later what that actually means. Um, and because Prometheus was, is so popular within Kubernetes, and I guess that's why everyone is here today, um, we started with uh, Prometheus being the um, example implementation, um, but there are other implementations for other uh, monitoring systems out there, such as Stackdriver and others. And uh, this is something very, very new. This is only in alpha, where, whereas the other two APIs um, are in beta and are available on all Kubernetes clusters. Um, the external me metrics API is very similar to the custom metrics API. However, it must not be um, related to a Kubernetes object. Um, what this is useful for is when you, for example, have some service that you're consuming by your cloud provider, let's say, uh, they have some sort of a, a mes message broker um, that you're consuming, and there's a queue length metric that that uh, system exposes, um, but it doesn't run in your Kubernetes cluster. You can't, so you can't say, my pod um, has this metric. Um, so uh, that's what this uh, use case is for. This is an alpha, um, but there are already some implementations uh, out there for this. So now that we n understand what auto-scaling is on an, on an abstract sense, um, and we understand the current uh, metrics APIs around Kubernetes, let's look at the concrete example with Prometheus. So to make sure that we all understand how Prometheus works and then how this entire system um, works uh, as a whole, let's have a look at how Prometheus works. So in Prometheus, you, your application keeps its um, metrics in memory. Um, and this has very little overhead. Um, and basically, in this example, we have started our application, and um, it has just started. So the uh, request count to this uh, has not, it hasn't received any traffic, so request count is zero. So Prometheus is configured to scrape those metrics every interval, in this case, and this is the default, every 15 seconds. And when it does that, it takes the metrics your application exposes and writes it into its time series database. And then we actually um, add our application to a load balancer, and it receives some traffic. And then uh, the internal request counter um, is counted up, and then the um, scrape interval has passed, and Prometheus will again scrape this information, insert it into its time series database, and basically do that um, for eternity. Um, so let me, let's make this use uh, the HPA. Uh, let's make the HPA use this. Um, so in order to be able to accommodate the features that we wanted to, uh, we had to create a new version of the horizontal pod autoscaler object. Um, because, if you remember, uh, we were only able to specify uh, the CPU utilization. Um, so the first couple of fields that you're seeing here are actually identical to the first version. However, the very thing that we wanted to change is now an array of metrics, not a single metric. Um, and 
we can specify multiple metrics about uh, multiple types. In this case, I'm showing something where uh, I'm saying every pod um, in this uh, associated with this object exposes a metric called um, HTTP requests, and actually um, the adapter gives us some help here because the actual metric that my application exposes here is HTTP requests total, but I'm not interested really in terms of uh, scaling about the total requests. I'm, a, I'm interested in the requests per second. So it knows um, which ones of these are um, counters, basically converts those, and then we can say what we want our target value for each pod to be. So when this target value is exceeded, um, that we spin up more replicas of this in order to cover our demand. Um, and there are two types of uh, thresholds we can set here. One is, a, is an actual value, so in this case, it makes sense to use a value. But for something like CPU or memory utilization, we would, again, probably want something um, percentage-based. So when the, when the HPA actually does, does these requests, the way this works is that the, um, these APIs are what we call aggregated APIs in Kubernetes. And what this means is that when we create these actual instances, so obviously there needs to be some application serving these a APIs, it registers them with the uh, Kubernetes API server. And when then the H HPA just asks the Kubernetes API server, give me that value from the resource metrics API, the API server actually just basically proxies that to the actual um, instance of the metrics server if we're um, requesting the core, the resource metrics API. And um, as we said earlier, the met metrics server then goes and, or actually, periodically goes and scrapes these metrics, and in this case, it will just Im immediately return whatever it has in memory about that requested metric. Now, with the custom metrics API, uh, this is a bit more complicated. You uh, need your actual monitoring system. If you use something like Prometheus, you may be running that within your actual cluster as well, or not. Um, with, if you use some vendor, you probably are not running that within your cluster, but it's outside of your cluster, and then you, your um, custom metrics API would call out to that vendor and then return uh, that information. And Prometheus had, has all of this information because it goes through your... Um, I mean, you need to set up Prometheus correctly to do this, but it's pretty easy to do that. And um, you scrape all of these th um, pods, and the metrics that they expose. And that way, then, when you when you'd perform a request against the custom metrics API, it will perform a query. Basically, it is a translation layer, which converts the custom metrics request into a Prometheus query, and then um, queries Prometheus and returns the result. Now, in terms of the, result, uh, the example that I just showed, um, how, how that actually internally works is that um, when we say we want the HTTP requests rate um, of all of my pods of this associated object, then, I, then what the custom metrics uh, adapter does here is it does a rate, so the inner function we can see here, on the metric called HTTP requests total, and it makes sure uh, to add a selector here to only select those pods that are actually relevant right now, and it uh, applies a uh, range query, is what we call uh, this in Prometheus, uh, which means I want to see the rate over the past five minutes. And then it sums all of those uh, by pods. Um, that's more, uh, not, wouldn't necessarily be uh, important for this query, but in general it doesn't hurt, uh, because if we, we can do some additional um, grouping when we specify the metric we want to query, and uh, basically we could do something like um, requests per route or per uh, method, and then we want to scale based on that. Um, so yeah. So let's let's see this in action. I have uh, obviously my blog running on Kubernetes, um, and uh, let's see. Nobody here in this room has done any requests against my blog. Sad. Um, so uh, let's put some some load onto this. So I have prepared something. 
that will put some load onto this. And I, my HBA object looks very similar, looks actually, actually exactly like what I just showed in, in my example. So I'm now putting some load onto my, my blog, and it uh, creates metrics for all of the pods that are running my blog. And um, hopefully, as we can see, um, actually the object that I applied has a max of 30 in case you all start DDoSing my blog. Um, so uh, hopefully we should now soon start seeing that the uh, traffic increases for my blog, and uh, then eventually that the um, replicas are increased because of that. So we can already see um, that uh, the traffic increases, and the horizontal pod autoscaler actually has a cooldown, so um, it only scales um, periodically, so it doesn't, when, when there's one spike up or down, that it immediately tears down all of the pods, uh, or immediately spins up 50,000. Um, so uh, it does this periodically, and uh, for now, we'll go back to the um, presentation, and then we'll check in later to see uh, that this actually actually worked, hopefully. If not, I have a recording. Um, so now uh, that we've seen all of this, all of this system, what do I see, what do I already know is going to happen in this space um, in, the, in the near future? And after that, I will make some predictions of what I believe is going to happen. So the reason why we've been doing uh, all of this work is because we felt Heapster was not um, was not efficient enough of a solution uh, for this. So uh, we, just last week, have started formally um, the, pro the process to formally deprecate Heapster. Um, and pretty much within uh, SIG instrumentation, uh, we believe that this is uh, the correct thing to do. And uh, actually, as of Kubernetes 1.10, all of the critical things for a Kubernetes cluster to operate have been migrated uh, to use the resource metrics API. Um, so we felt now is the time, now that we have migrated everything, uh, now is the time to deprecate the system and move on. And um, as I already mentioned, um, horizontal pod autoscaling is really uh, the, the default thing to do today in Kubernetes, but it does, it's not always the right thing. So for databases, for example, it's very often important to still increase uh, vertically. Um, so there is a lot of work going on with this, but there's no, um, the, the, all, of, all of that work is still in, in alpha, and it only supports Prometheus. Um, because it turns out uh, vertical pod autoscaling is a lot more complicated and a lot more fragile, so there's a lot more um, thought that needs to go into that as opposed to we have some uh, uh, limit per, per pod and we uh, just want to increase that all the time because this would involve spinning up new pods and things like that. So uh, there needs to be some more uh, thought to put, put into it. Um, and something really cool, uh, personally, I think, is that um, very soon uh, in Kubernetes 1.11, we'll be able to scale custom resource definitions in Kubernetes. So in case you don't know, uh, custom resource definitions are a mechanism in Kubernetes to extend the Kubernetes API. So for example, I am the maintainer of uh, the Prometheus operator, which allows you to create Prometheus objects uh, within your Kubernetes cluster, uh, similar to how you create a deployment in your Kubernetes cluster. And this will allow us to auto-scale uh, those kinds of resources. And I think that's really exciting, uh, because it means that we can very natively create these uh, extensions to the Kubernetes API and have them behave exactly the same way as all the other resources. And I just want to give a shout out to Stefan and Nikita, who have been really hard, of, hard at work uh, doing this. So thanks, thanks to them, we will be soon uh, able to do this. And uh, one, of the, one other thing that we're working on within uh, SIG instrumentation is uh, we, over the past year, two, or three, uh, we have realized within SIG instrumentation that the metrics that we provide in Kubernetes are not as stable as we would like them to be. Um, so there are a number of proposals out there in order to um, improve this state so that we can have a better 
uh, confidence in um, the metrics that we're using today will be there tomorrow. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, while that's not super exciting in itself, I think it's really important for this entire ecosystem to be able to share all of this knowledge, because if a um, metric can go away from one day to another, then it's basically useless. Um, so those are the things that I know are going to happen. Now, um, some predictions that I think um, would be cool to happen, um, but I don't know if they're going to happen. So I, I think it would be really cool, because we can auto-scale um, custom resources, um, it would be really cool if we do the, uh, use the work that some of the companies have been uh, working on, where they, have, uh, where they describe a cluster um, with custom resource definitions, such as node pools, uh, that we can use all of these primitives that we have and uh, the mechanisms that are available in custom resources that we can automatically scale our clusters with those primitives. And today, the cu cluster autoscaler is a separate component that actually does a, a lot of the very similar work as the horizontal pod autoscaler does. So I'm hoping um, that all of these projects um, will one, one day be combined. And this goes very... Uh, very much into the thought of stable metrics, but as a more broader thing happening in the monitoring space, which is uh, standardization of all this monitoring. So there's uh, uh, an effort called Open Metrics, which is standardizing the format, uh, basically, that Prometheus has. Uh, obviously, there are some, some changes probably going to happen to it, but um, it's based on that. And uh, what's really exciting is that all of these monitoring vendors are coming together um, and working with the Prometheus team and other open source um, in order to create a standard that all of these monitoring systems can then use. Because um, all Kubernetes components are already serving Prometheus-style metrics. So I think that's really cool. And in, within our bubble, more or less, um, there's also some really awesome things happening, like gRPC. Um, while HTTP metrics are already pretty standardized um, in the Prometheus ecosystem, gRPC gives us even more um, structure as to how our HTTP handlers are registered. And that gives us the possibility to create dashboards, alerting rules, and auto-scaling uh, mechanisms that work across all of our organizations. So I think that's really powerful. And um, together with that service mesh, um, really um, puts, brings this to another level where every single pod within our infrastructure exposes these metrics and they're all, um, they're all the same with, uh, across our entire cluster. So that's really powerful for observability. So really what all of this boils down to is we can build reusable alerts, dashboards, and why we're all here is to build reusable um, auto-scaling and share all of this knowledge that we have running these applications that are now exposing very similar metrics in order to serve our customers and uh, fulfill our service level objectives. So with that, let's have a look at our uh, horizontal pod autoscaler again. Let's see if someone totally broke everything. Nobody did, cool. Um, so we now have um, more um, replicas of, of, our, of my blog. Isn't that cool? And we can see that we have uh, sort of a stable um, request line, which is around 2,000 requests per second, uh, which is exactly the thing uh, that we've specified. Um, yeah, so that worked. Awesome. And with that, thank you. <laughs>